What am I doing talking to a room full of healthcare providers, you might ask? My, my favorite story uh, about this comes from my daughter was little and she was in the other room and I heard a friend of hers say, what does your mother do? And Katie said, my mother's a columnist. And her friend very aptly said, what's that? And there was this kind of pause and then Katie said, uh, well, my mother gets paid for telling people what she thinks. So I thought this was as good, about as good a job description as any, and when I was invited to give a class at Stanford, I decided to call it telling people what you think. So I arrived on the Stanford campus, and I opened up the course catalog, and it said Ellen Goodman will be here as a visiting professor, and she will be teaching a course called Telling People What to Think. <laughs> <laughs> So this was sort of appalling. I went down to the registrar's office, and she said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that. And she sent out a campus-wide email saying, Ellen Goodman is here as a visiting professor, and she will be teaching a course called Telling People How They Think. <laughs> so I went from being a fascist to being a neurobiologist. <laughs> And it is that neurobiology that is my sole medical credential for being with you here tonight. Uh, what I have been, however, as Julie said, is a chronicler of social change. And now as the founder of the Conversation Project, I am trying to make change. So tonight I'm talking to you because whether any of the women in this room have it on their resumes or not, you are change agents. That's what the Schwartz Center is all about, transforming the relationship between patients and providers, and that's what the Conversation Project is all about, transforming the culture in which this relationship can flourish. So let me go back for just a minute and remind all of you, if you need these reminders, about just how much change we have all been through already. Um, my mother's generation regarded doctors as gods, delivering prescriptions from the mountains and writing uh, diagnoses on tablets. My generation is much more likely to think of doctors as partners, if not junior partners. It's been over 40 years since a group of Boston women wrote the seminal book of our healthcare understanding our bodies, ourselves. This was a book that told women who knew astonishingly little about their own bodies just to take ownership of that information. And in some ways, I think of that as the very beginning of people-centered medicine. Today, people are getting information, misinformation, and disinformation from a lot of sources. Before they see a healthcare provider, they have undoubtedly seen Dr. Google and probably Dr. Oz. The evening news is punctuated by ads for COPD and promises that if you take Cialis, you will have sex in a hot air balloon or in two bathtubs. <laughs> My husband and I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> they have gotten, for that matter, their diagnosis from a blog and their prognosis from a television show. They've chatted about their symptoms on Facebook and joined a Twitter group. There is a message in all of this change, which is that medicine has to become more person and family centered. The world puts a much stronger priority these days on conversations of all kinds between providers and people. The second and related change that we have all been through has to do with demography. Need I remind you that the baby boomer generation have been the primary change agents of our cultures. We were the ones who started the uh, women's movement, we were the ones who started the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, and now we are willy-nilly in the midst of another social change pushed by the longevity revolution. In the last century, the average American's lifespan has increased by 30 years, 
it's gone from 47 to 78, and for women, uh, to 80. And every day, another 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 and lets us know about it. Now, we know all of this in terms of numbers, in terms of arithmetic, but Americans haven't yet absorbed it emotionally or personally. We are told that 50 is the new 40. You've all read this. But how many of you read that 60 is the new caregiver of the 85-year-old and 70 is the new caregiver of the 95-year-old? So now let me put on my second hat, since this is a super Schwartz round, as an entrepreneur of social change. We are told that we have a generation that is poised to overwhelm the healthcare system. But we also have a generation of people who were encouraged to lead examined lives, you all know that phrase, and who are poised to do something new, to examine how we want to live, how we want to be listened to, as well as to listen all the way through our lifespan to its very end. Technology, we all know, has led to modern miracles and the ability to prolong life. It has also meant that death is much less likely to be what we used to think of as natural. It's made it clear that many of us will face a cascading and confusing number of medical decisions as we or our loved ones come to the end of their lives. You all know that. You live that every day. But we need to share that story with all of the other people in our world. The healthcare improvements that have led us to the longevity revolution have also led us to this tipping point, to the moment when we are, have to face the one difficult and crucial conversation which many of us have avoided for far too long, the conversation about how we want to live at the end of our lives. This is the right time for that conversation. If there is one condition that everyone in this diverse, contentious, and wide world shares, it is this one, mortality. My favorite line of that, this came from the satirical publication, The Onion, with the headline that read, death rate holds steady at 100%. <laughs> We are all mortal, and yet, as you all know, we have been immeasurably slow in recognizing and acknowledging how many of the people we love are not dying in the way that they would choose if they had those conversations. We have to consciously implant a portable Schwartz round in every relationship between patient and provider we need to convince everyone, healthcare providers and people, that if we do absolutely everything to improve the patient experience but do nothing to improve the way people are dying for them and their survivors, we will have failed. So if we are able to tackle a problem that will literally affect everyone, if we want to transform something as huge as healthcare, we have to think big. We need to change the way the people we love are dying. This is the belief that's at the heart of the Conversation Project, a public engagement campaign to have everyone's wishes expressed and respected both. We want to change the cultural norm from not talking about our wishes to talking about them and to making this a normal part of the adult checklist of responsibilities. Most of the social changes that we have all been through, particularly as women in our lifetime, have come because of stories. Uriel Rukeyser, the poet, says, the world is not made up of atoms, it's made up of stories. And I think that is true. We know, and I know from having covered the women's movement in particular, that there was a time when everybody had a story, but they kept it quiet, absolutely sure that they were the only one. And it wasn't until those stories were shared that social change began. And we are at that place again 
in thinking about end of life. So I, of course, began the conversation project with my, my own story. Around the time I turned 60, I went from being a working mother to being a working daughter. Heads will start nodding, I am sure. <laughs> um, my, don't, uh, my mother began a long and slow decline. My mother and I could talk about everything. I once described her in a column as a woman who would listen to you talk about your problems until you were bored with them. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that we didn't talk about was what she wanted at the end of life. Sometimes she would say to me, she would point to someone in a bad situation or tell me a story and she would say, if I'm ever like that, pull the plug. But as all of you know, when the time came, there wasn't a plug to pull. After she died, I began meeting with a group of other women and men in Boston. We took off our professional hats at that first meeting and told our stories. And they were stories about good deaths and hard deaths. And we realized that the difference between a good death and a hard death was often whether we had had the conversation with that person that we loved. In surveys, we then started thinking, how do we make this easier? How could our loved ones live at the end of their lives in ways they would want? And how could their survivors, and in time our own survivors, be left with less guilt, less uncertainty about whether they had done the right thing? In surveys, we know 70% of people say they want to die at home and 70% die in hospitals and institutions, the exact reverse. Home isn't a place, it's a way of dying, surrounded by people who love you, pain-free, in being cared for, being comfortable. Um, we began to think about this, and by the way, not in an ICU. We began to think, how do we make those wishes expressed and in turn respected. We know, after all, that unless families are able to have these conversations around the kitchen table, we will be stuck. People will not be dying in the way that they choose. We went to IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and they pulled together an experts meeting for us. They have been our huge supporters all the way through, and we are housed in the, under their roof. And when they pulled together that first experts meeting, all the people who had been in end of life for a long, long time expressed finally by the end of their day their frustration that the needle hadn't moved. Somebody here tonight said, I had this experience 30 years ago and I'd have the same experience today. And that was what those experts expressed to us. And they said, what we need to do is move outside. We need to go for cultural change. We need to change the atmosphere in which we are all working. Um, and we need to have these conversations earlier, not in the ICU, because as one of our advisors likes to say, it's always too soon until it is too late. After all, how many of those marathoners who were tying up their shoes that morning knew that by the end of the day, they would be faced with incredible healthcare, and life decisions. For the most part, Americans assume that such conversations take place between doctors and between patients and care providers, but too many doctors remain uncomfortable and untrained. In one Massachusetts survey, only 17% of people have had these conversations with their doctors, and in California, only 7% have had them, which is essentially nobody. So, we were been, uh, what, we, what we began with next was to create a public media campaign. We launched a campaign to break through the conspiracy of denial and to change the norm. Our campaign builds on the work which all of you have been doing um, and we hope will raise all of that work by asking everybody a simple question, have you had the conversation? On our website, we have a conversation starter kit, and it doesn't ask medical questions so much as questions about values. We want people to talk about what matters to them, 
before they talk about what's the matter with them. We uh, want change to come from the outside in and from early on so that by the time people come to a medical crisis, they will have thought through and talked through their values. We can not only make life easier and more humane for people, but frankly, for their providers. These deeply humane conversations are hard, but we can make them easier by making them begin with family members as well. In our first eight months, nearly 100,000 people have come to our website, which is great, but more interestingly, almost 40% have downloaded our starter kit. So we know that people are eager to have something to hold on to that can help them when they have these conversations with their families. We now have a kit called How to Talk to Your Doctor, and I will not tell you that the subtitle around the office is in case he or she won't talk to you. <laughs> we are working now as well to bring the conversation project to do two things, to increase our national campaign to share and collect stories because we know just as here, every time we talk about this, everybody has a story and we want those stories to be shared. And we are also working to bring the conversation project to people where they live, where they work, and where they pray. And we just had a, our first interfaith meeting for the project in, with Boston uh, clergy two weeks ago. We are also working with partners like the Schwartz Center to ready the healthcare system to respect these wishes. If we're doing the expressing, we want healthcare providers to do the respecting. And our IHI partners have also uh, have an audacious plan to make healthcare systems ready, called the Conversation Ready Initiative, where healthcare systems will develop a plan, a good housekeeping seal of approval, what it takes actually to, for a healthcare system to think of itself as conversation ready. We have been to a number of communities. We've been we have a group of people who we have been partnering with who are eager to think of themselves and to move toward being conversation ready as an entire community. But of course, in our hometown, what we really want is for Boston to be the center, to be the pioneer, to take the lead in making our hometown, our community, the conversation ready, the conversation ready community. If our audacious idea were in a course catalog, it would be under humanities and not under economics, I assure you. Our goal is to honor people's wishes, whatever they are. But we know that a quarter of all Medicare dollars go to the 5% of people in the last year of life. We know that one in 10 elders has surgery in the last week of their life. And we know that a lot of that is unwanted or perhaps against the patient's end of life wishes. Today, the debate about health care that we're all engaged in is too often framed in the language of cost-cutting, rationing of less and less. It's framed as what a health care system will do to you. But what if we can all together break out of that frame? This is, after all, one area in which letting patient and family's choices drive the decision could result in lower costs, financial and more importantly, emotional. We may even be able to rebuild trust in the medical system by respecting people's wishes. More importantly, we can ensure a more humane death. So this is a big undertaking a big cultural change, but we have made such cultural changes before. Remember when hospice sounded like a foreign word? Remember when we could only whisper the word cancer, and now we can all yell out loud about erectile dysfunction? <laughs> Remember how the model of birth in America was transformed from the outside in? If one generation, it was not we recall doctors who invited people in who said, get your feet out of the stirrups, 
have your husband bring the video camera. Would you like to have the baby in a bathtub? It was people who changed that from the outside in, and the healthcare system responded. Um, if we can change, if one generation can change the way we give birth, this generation can change the way we die. And by bringing compassion, the skills of talking, conversation, listening, caring, we know that providers need all of these skills, particularly in delivering bad news, and the place to begin may be at the hardest one in delivering and thinking about end of life. One of the unique gifts of the Schwartz Center and Schwartz Rounds is they provide a place where providers can be people. For us, that's an ideal place to begin because we believe everyone has to have the conversation before they can lead it. If the last generation did transform the way we be birthed, we can indeed transform the way we die. So now what I have said is that all of you are change agents. We need you to recognize that. We need you to change the cultural norm, to have the conversation, to share your stories, to engage the public long before a crisis. We need to do the work readying the ground and readying the healthcare system as well. We need to make Boston our particular city on a hill. You stand at the intersection of people and healthcare and we need the public dialogue to be earlier and wider to really lift this to the next level. The Conversation Project does not have all the answers or all the resources about how to foster this cultural change. We're gonna need all the help that we can get um, as individuals, from people in your church groups, from people in your workplace, from people in your book group, all of you in Boston, an audacious community after all in transforming healthcare, a place where the Schwartz Center began the whole work of compassionate care is a great place to begin. And we also have a long way to go. We hope you will become our change agents, not just as leaders, but as individuals. And so we hope that very soon, next time we're here, we will be able to ask, have you had the conversation? And that you and all of the people that you work with will answer with a resounding yes. Thank you.